Good morning, everyone. It's great to see you. It's absolutely fantastic to hear all the noise. I hope you had a lovely breakfast for those of us who joined us here. Um, whether this is your first week or whether you've been coming here for years, it's great to see you. Obviously, this is Gorse Hill Baptist Church, but it's not our church, it's God's church. So you're absolutely welcome. It's great to see you. A massive welcome to Chris and his wife, Fiona, who I've currently lost. Ah, they're at the back there. Lovely to see you both. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, Chris, is, Chris is a Baptist minister, but currently working full-time doing New Testament research at Bristol Baptist College. And uh, him and Fiona have got three uh, teenage, ch not teenage, children in their 20s. So thank you for coming over here. We're glad you made it through the weather, and uh, we appreciate you being here. Before we start, and before Matt and the worship group lead us in some worship, we're just going to start with a, a word of prayer, so let's pray. Lord Jesus, we just want to thank you for the privilege of being able to meet together here this morning, to worship you without fear of persecution, being arrested or getting hurt. I know it's something I take for granted, and I'm sure most of us do as well, Lord Jesus, so we really do appreciate the, the fact that we're able to come here and worship you. I want to thank you for all my brothers and sisters here, both young and old. Thank you for the amazing children. We're so blessed in this church to have so many young children, and they bring such a joy to us with their enthusiasm, and the fact that they want to be here is great, and their friendships, and it's just lovely to see them interacting with each other, so we thank you for them. Lord, we want to thank you this morning for Chris, willing to give up his time to bring us your word. We want to lift up his family. We want to thank you for Fiona in supporting him this morning and for their children. We just pray that you'll bless him this morning. We pray that he will be touched by you as well and that all the work he's put in this week will be breathed on now by you, Lord Jesus, and that you will just use him as a vessel. So we pray for him as well. And for us all this morning, Lord Jesus, I just pray that you'll welcome our praise and I pray that you'll meet every single one of us, whatever we need to be met, whether... We're having good weeks, bad weeks, whatever's coming next week, we just pray that where people need a special touch from you this morning, that they'll get it. So we just ask now, Lord, that you'll send your Holy Spirit now and fill this place. Amen. Amen. Over to you. Thank you, Rob. Good morning, everybody. It's good to see you all. Um, my name's Matt, for those who don't know me. Um, we're going to spend some time now in sung worship. So I encourage you, if you are able to, um, let's jump to our feet. Um, there's also a box of instruments and music things um, down at the front. So if you want to kind of make a joyful noise and join in that way, then you're absolutely welcome to. Um, we're going to start by singing the song that we did last week that may have been a bit new, uh, Giant of Faith. So hopefully it's still fresh in your mind. So let's sing. We all come in different shapes and Sizes. Life is full of many surprises. But one thing stays the same. Jesus is on my side. I don't need to be afraid. I don't need to run and hide. When I open my Bible, as clear as can be. The God that I read about with me.
please take your seats. <coughs> I think that's blown a few cobwebs off, warmed you up a little bit. Um, just want to run through a couple of notices. If anybody's got a particular notice they want me to do, put your hand up in a second and I'll get you up here. Um, there's uh, weekly notices at the back there on the sheets. Most of you will have received an email yesterday or the day before with all the different activities that are going on in the church over the next week. So if you don't get that via email and you want to sign up to that, speak to Lars. If not, grab a sheet from the back. But a couple of notices from me. The first one is for Band of Brothers, the guys that have got their names down for the Skittles. That's this Thursday, just a reminder, 7 o'clock at the Woodshaw Pub in Wooten Bassett. Don't forget to bring your £12 cash because we need to pay for the food and then bring some other coins for the raffle and whatever money's left over we give to a charity. The winning team nominates a charity that they want the money to go to. So for those guys who've got their names down for that, 7 o'clock at the Woodshaw in Wooten Bassett this Thursday. Now, Melanie's asked me to give a notice this morning and it's about Olive's service of celebration. Now, when Melanie sent me the message this week, the word that jumped out to me was celebration. Now, she hadn't put it in bold, she hadn't underlined it, but it came straight out of the page at me, and I thought, yeah, that is what it is. It is a, a, a time of celebration for Olive, and although it's sad for Melanie and for the family and for all of us who loved Olive, it is a way to celebrate her life and what she was to us. Now, me and my family, Steph, we loved the bones of Olive. Now, we used to sit over that side of the church for many, many years, and I know we're all creatures of habit, and once you get your seat, that's where you stay for the rest of your life. <laughs> so we used to sit over there for many, many years. And I've never said this to you, Melanie, but one of the things that I really used to enjoy was Olive singing. If any of you have had the pleasure of sitting next to her when she sings, she had a wonderful voice. And quite often I'd find myself stop singing, close my eyes, and just listen to Olive. So it was a real blessing, and it used to really encourage me. And she used to always take the time, the whole time we've been here, to ask Steph and I how we were, what we were up to, how the children were. So she is going to be really missed. So, guys, if you're free, this Wednesday, it's at 10.45 in the church. I know Melanie and the family would love to see you all. And just remember, it's a service of celebration. We're here to celebrate all the good things that Olive was. Um, we're going to do the offering in a minute. We're just about to take that up. If you're a visitor amongst us, please don't feel awkward or embarrassed about that. Most of our congregation do it via bank transfer and stuff, so they'll be letting the bag pass by them as well. Uh, the reason we do that is because the money that comes in helps support the church, it helps support the running of the church, all the charities and things that we support both in this country and abroad. So we're going to do that now, but please, if you've not come prepared for that, don't feel awkward about that at all. Just let the bag pass you by. Okay, stewards, if you can do that, that would be great. All right, we're just going to pray for the offering and then for the children as they go out to their classes. So let's pray. Lord Jesus, we just want to thank you for all the things that you provide for us. You give us stuff every single day, stuff that we don't even realise that we've had it. So we just want to thank you for all the provisions that you give us. Lord Jesus, we just want you to take this money that we've collected up this morning and any money that's been transferred across the banks over the week, the month, Lord, and we pray for wisdom. We want to maximise that money for your good. 
So we just pray that you'll give us the wisdom to use it in the right places, to not use it on things that you don't want us to. Give us clear direction of the best way to use this money. And for the children, Lord, again, we thank you. What a blessing they are to us. How fantastic it is to hear their enthusiasm, to hear their excitement, just to all the noise and the hustle and bustle that they bring to the church. We're so blessed to have so many young people. We just pray, Lord, that you will be with them now as they leave to go to their own groups. We pray that they'll continue to form their friendships that will hopefully see them all the way through to their adulthood, be able to support one another as they go through their Christian lives. We pray that they'll learn more about you, they'll learn to trust you more and have faith in you. And we really want to lift up their teachers, the people that are leading them. Again, Lord Jesus, sometimes it might be something we take a little bit for granted, that there's always going to be people out there to support our children and to teach them. But we thank you for them. We thank you that they give up the time they could be spending in here to help nourish and develop our children into good Christians. So we thank you for them. We pray that it will be a good time for them too, Lord. Amen. All right then, children, off you go. I'm just going to ask Maureen uh, to come up now. She's going to lead us in our prayers for the worship group come back on and lead us in some more songs. Uh, Maureen's going to come up and share some prayers with us. So thank you, Maureen. So I just wonder how excited you are to be in God's presence. It's lovely to see the children excited, but we need to be excited too, don't we? So let's pray together. Dear Lord and Heavenly Father, we come before you now not only to offer our praise and our worship, but also to bring before you our concerns for our families, our friends, our town and our world. We pray that you would bless each family represented here. You know what's going on within all those families and we especially ask you to bless those who are going through difficult times, those who are finding it hard to make ends meet, and those who are struggling because perhaps they are the only Christian in that family. We give you thanks for the families who are committed to you and who show your love to all around them. We pray for those in our fellowship who are ill, <coughs> And there are lots for us to remember today. We think of Sue Martin, Trevor Hancock, Terry Bassett, Jeff Goulding, Peter Payne, Sandra Hawkins, John Woods. And there are many who are mentioned in our weekly news sheet. So we name them and others we know in the silence of our hearts. And we pray, Lord, for a healing touch from you on all those we have mentioned and those we have thought of. And we think especially today of those in our church family who are hurting, and especially those mourning the loss of loved ones. We pray for Melanie, Enzo and their family, giving thanks for the life of Olive, who is now safe in your keeping. We remember her lovely smile and her encouraging words and thank you so much for her life. We remember Jackie, Caroline, Mark, Michael and their families as they mourn the loss of John, a former minister of this church who means so much to them and to so many other people here. We thank you for John's ministry at Gorse Hill Baptist Church over many years and thank you for the lives he touched during his time as a minister here and in other churches. We remember the family of John Webb, Lord, as they mourn his loss. And we remember with thanks the life of Eva Brown and pray for her family both here and in Jamaica. God of all comfort, please be near to all these families today. Let your presence be felt now and in the coming days. We pray that you will comfort them, wrap your loving arms around them, 
and speak words of assurance and comfort to them, if necessary, through us. And so help us to be channels of your peace and love. We pray for our town of Swindon and for all the good things that happen here. For the mayor and members of the council. And in these difficult times, would you be with them as they make decisions that affect us and different areas of our town? We thank you for the work that goes on in this church at the community fridge and with the bags of hope. We pray that all those who are recipients of the food and bags, that they may want to know more about you. We thank you for all those who give at their time week by week to help at the fridge, to fill the bags, and for all those who deliver them regularly. We pray for those who do collections from various supermarkets, and we thank you for the relationships being made with those in the supermarkets too as the food is collected. We also ask you to bless all the groups that meet here during the week, and particularly those who attend but who don't know you. May we all encourage them to come to know you as we do, as their Lord and Saviour, and let us not do anything or say anything that would hinder them. We pray for Jake and the various teams who work with our children here. May we show them and the children that it's great to be a follower of Jesus and that he is always with them, no matter where or what they do. We pray for ourselves in this fellowship as we seek to find a new minister. Lord, you will already have chosen the one so help us to tune in to your heart for our church. We remember those who are suffering in our own country because of the various strikes and those whose lives are impacted by these strikes. We bring to you the thousands of families who are suffering in various parts of the world because of war, famine, floods, and any other disasters. And we particularly remember those in Afghanistan, Iran, and the Ukraine, and especially those known to us personally. Lord, there is so much that we don't understand, but we trust you, and we ask that we might be persistent in prayer for our brothers and sisters who are suffering in various parts of the world. And now let us just take a moment to think of those who are on either side of us, those who are in front of us, those who are behind us. You may not know everyone who's around you this morning, but God knows them. And maybe God is speaking to you, if you don't know someone, to have a word with them afterwards. That might be just the word they need going into a new week. So let's bring our prayers together as we say the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. We're going to continue uh, in an attitude of prayer and worship now as we sing a, a few more songs together. So just encourage you to, uh, to, to remain seated, to stand, uh, do what you need to do at this time. In the 
just spend a moment in quiet. Just thinking what, what that last line means for each of us. You alone I long to worship. You alone are worthy of my praise. What is our praise this morning? What is our praise in our life? come before you afresh today giving you our hearts giving you our life again Lord that's not a one time thing we give it daily to you Lord Jesus and we say have your way with us have your way in this church Amen Amen Please take your seats Thank you guys that was brilliant Thank you so much
<coughs> so Chris is going to come up and speak to us in a couple of minutes. Um, but before he does that, he asked me to do a reading for him. So the reading this morning is from Genesis chapter 6, verses 5 to 22. And it's a story of Noah. And I know Chris is going to be talking to us in a couple of minutes about Noah and mainly about his leadership abilities and skills. So Genesis chapter 6, 5 to 22. The Lord saw how great the wickedness of the human race had become on the earth and that every inclination of the thoughts of the human heart was only evil all the time. The Lord regretted that he had made human beings on the earth and his heart was deeply troubled. So the Lord said, I will wipe from the face of the earth the human race I've created and with them the animals, the birds and the creatures that move along the ground for I regret that I have made them. But Noah found favour in the eyes of the Lord. So this is the account of Noah and his family. Noah was a righteous man, blameless among the people of his time, and he walked faithfully with God. Noah had three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Now the earth was corrupt in God's sight and was full of violence. God saw how corrupt the earth had become, for all the people on the earth had corrupted their ways. So God said to Noah, I'm going to put an end to all the people, for the earth is filled with violence because of them. I am surely going to destroy both them and the earth. So make yourself an ark of cypress wood. Make rooms in it and coat it with pitch inside and out. This is how you are to build it. The ark is to be 300 cubits long, 50 cubits wide and 30 cubits high. Make a roof for it leaving below the roof an opening one cubit, high all around. Put a door in the side of the ark and make lower, middle and upper decks. I am going to bring flood waters on the earth to destroy all life under the heavens, every creature that has breath of life in it. Everything on earth will perish. But I am going to establish my covenant with you and you will enter the ark, you and your sons and your wives and your sons' wives with you. You are to bring into the ark two of all living creatures, male and female, to keep them alive with you. Two of every kind of bird, of every kind of animal, and of every kind of creature that moves along the ground will come to you to be kept alive. You are to take every kind of food that is to be eaten and store it away as food for you and for them. Noah did everything just as God had commanded him. Pray with Chris quick before he starts. Lord Jesus, we just want to lift Chris up to you now. Again, we want to thank you for him coming here this morning. We thank you for Fiona. We just pray that you'll bless him now, Lord. All the work that he's done on this talk, all the preparation, Lord, we just pray that you'll breathe your Holy Spirit into it now. We pray that when he leaves this place, he will really feel like he's met with you this morning. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Chris. Thank you. Well, thank you. Good morning. It's lovely to be here with you today. It's good to worship with you. Um, it's good to meet up with our old friends Colin and Truce, um, which is, we've got them to blame for me being here this morning. Uh, and I know that uh, it's an it's a interesting and perhaps a challenging time for the life of your church. You're, you're looking for a new minister. And I'm sure that during this time, um, even this morning, there are those uh, within the church who are stepping up, doing roles that maybe you find a little bit challenging, a little bit uncomfortable, that are sort of stretching uh, what you feel you're able to do. And perhaps that applies to you outside as church as well, whether that's at work um, or in your family life or in the community. Maybe you find yourselves um, being put in positions where you're having to take a lead, do things that you find a little bit challenging. So I thought today I would talk about leadership. Now, the Bible is, isn't an instruction manual in the way that we, we sort of typically think of an instruction manual. Um, if you buy a new gadget, uh, these days you often don't get it, you just get sent a code and you have to look on the internet if you want the manual. But in the good old days, you'd get this thick wadge of paper in about 20 different languages and you'd find the bit in English and you'd, and you'd look at the bit that said what you, what you were looking for. And the, the Bible isn't an instruction manual in the sense there isn't an index that says, uh, 
how to be a good leader, and you look up that section, and that tells you exactly what to do. Rather, in the main, the Bible, including it, Jesus in his life and in his teaching, uh, teaches us through, through stories, through showing us, often rather than telling us. So the Bible gives us characters, it gives us people, and invites us to look at them, and to learn from them, and sometimes to learn from their mistakes, as well as from what they did well. So this morning, we're going to look at Noah. I, I was really impressed this morning. We sang a song that included Noah. Um, I think that must have been coincidence or God's providence, because I can't think of so any, I couldn't think of any songs that included Noah, but you, you had one this morning, which was great. But we read part of the story of Noah, and of course, Noah is a story that, that even people outside the church, it's one of those uh, stories that sort of is within our consciousness, this extraordinary story of Noah and the flood. And we're not going to look at the whole of it this morning, and there's all sorts of things we could say about it, but I'm just going to focus in perhaps on the leadership aspect, on what it meant for Noah, who, who didn't probably choose to be a leader, ended up in this role where he was giving leadership. So once upon a time, there was this man called Noah, and he lived, he lived like us, we might think, in a bad time, in a difficult time. The world was in a mess, and the mess, as usual, was caused by humans. In fact, in verse 5, Genesis tells us very starkly, every inclination of the thoughts of the human heart was only evil all the time. That's a pretty stark statement, isn't it? Every inclination of the thoughts of the human heart was only evil all the time. In fact, if you read that passage again, and you might want to do it later, there's an awful lot of mentions of the word all and every, uh, and generally really negative. Uh, generally, things were not good. It's what some theologians call total depravity. Everyone and everything is tainted by sin, by selfishness. It's not a new phenomenon. By contrast, we sang that, that wonder, those wonderful words just a few minutes ago. I will give you all my worship. I will give you all my praise. You alone, I long to worship. You alone are worthy of my praise. What a contrast between the, the depravity of hearts that are turned inwards, that are not Godward focused, that are looking to ourselves with, a hearts, with hearts that are focused on God and giving him all our worship. Anyway, into this terrible mess, a very special word makes its first appearance in the Bible. You might not notice it in the NIV, uh, which says that Noah found favor with God, verse 8. Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. But it's a word which in other contexts is translated grace. And it's the first time it appears in the Bible. And grace, as I'm sure you know, means getting something good when we deserve something bad. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved not a perfect person, not a deserving person, but a wretch like me. And God does that for Noah. God's grace, you see, verse 8, comes before verse 9, when we read about Noah's goodness. God's, Noah was a good man, but actually the most important thing is that God was gracious. God was gracious to Noah, and he found favor in Noah, even though Noah, like everyone else alive, was not a perfect person. He might have been better than some of the other people, but like all of us, he was not perfect. But God's grace was something that Noah found and discovered. So park that thought. But for now, I want to look at some of the ways in which Noah shows leadership, bearing in mind also what the Bible says elsewhere about leadership, and then we'll come back to that grace word a bit later. So the first thing about leadership I want to think about um, is that uh, Noah stands out. Now, I don't know if you can notice, but one of those ducks stands out. You have to look, but one of those ducks is different to all the others. And we see this in the life of Noah in more ways than one. Firstly, he stands out as a righteous person in a wicked world. He also stands out as a man building a ridiculously big boat in an arid country. 
Plus, he stands out in his family as the one who makes things happen, although that would have been norm, the norm in those patriarchal days. Now, leaders do not always build boats, obviously. And leaders are not always father figures. Even in the Old Testament, they're not always father figures. In fact, the leaders God uses are not always particularly good or nice people. You can think of some examples in the Bible, can't you? Jacob would be one. You think, why did God choose them of all people? But the point is that Noah stood out. And leaders are people who have to be prepared to stand out, to be prepared to be different, to be prepared to swim against the tide. It's a characteristic we, three, we see through the Bible, and of course we see it supremely in the Lord Jesus. And I invite you to think for a moment of the situations where God has given you leadership responsibilities. And you might think, you might immediately think, well, I'm not a leader, this doesn't apply to me. Well, I invite you to think that maybe it does apply to you. You may not have a formal leadership title, but if you're a parent, or a grandparent, or a godparent, or an aunt, or an uncle, if you're a teacher, or a TA, if you're a manager, or a sports team captain, a home group, or a CU leader, a neighborhood watch coordinator, a worship leader, even if you're only an employee, or a student, or a carer, or a neighbor, if you are a Christian, you do have a leadership role to play. You are an ambassador for Christ. And therefore, we all have to stand out to some degree. So how does Noah's example of standing out apply in your life and in my life? Leadership is often a lonely place. Good leaders don't try to isolate themselves, quite the opposite, but standing out will often bring some isolation. There was a price to pay for Noah, wasn't there? There was a price to pay for Noah, for Moses, for Jesus, for Paul. Are you and I willing to pay that price to stand out for Christ? Or is it more important to us that we stay beneath the radar, that we don't stand out? Let's just pause for a moment. Let's think of ourselves, but let's also think of those, particularly in our church life at the moment, who are in positions of leadership, perhaps positions that they didn't seek, but which they found themselves in. And let's think um, what it means for them to perhaps stand out. And let's pray for them and pray that we will support them as they do that. So let's think both of ourselves and of those in leadership positions. Let's just pause in the quietness and in the silence, just pray to God about that. Being called to stand out. Secondly, as well as being, as well as standing out, Noah is called. And I don't, know, I don't know how many of you have seen the, the film Evan Almighty. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a funny modern day version of the story of Noah set in America. And Evan is the slightly hapless hero to whom God gives a Noah style job. And Evan really does not want this job. But God doesn't give him any choice. Evan can't stop his beard growing or animals following him, or God turning up on his doorstep. Now, we don't know how the real Noah felt about his calling, but it's very clear that he was called. We read a lot about what God told him to do. We hear God's voice to Noah, always to Noah. By the way, we never hear Noah's voice. We never hear Noah's answer. We hear God's voice, and we see Noah doing we never hear Noah speaking. We see Noah obeying God's voice. He was called to build an ark, and that settled it. He got on and did it. 
Just now I encouraged us all to think of ourselves as leaders in God's kingdom. And I think that's biblical. We are all called to be leaders in some way in God's kingdom. But it's also a value which Baptists and similar churches rightly tend to emphasise. We all have significant roles to play here in church life. Every church member has been called into ministry. I don't know this church. I hope you don't use that horrible word laity here, as if there are ministers and lay people. Horrible concept. We're all called to ministry. But there is another perspective, which is also biblical, that there are some people whom God has specifically called into positions of spiritual leadership, whether that's in the local church or elsewhere or in cross-cultural missions somewhere else around the world. These are roles which often come with significant amounts of pressure, spiritual attack, criticism, temptation. And so these are roles to which you really need to be specifically called in some way. And we see this in the Bible. Noah, Abraham, Moses, David, the Old Testament prophets, the New Testament apostles, they were all very clearly called by God or by the Lord Jesus Christ. They didn't volunteer. In fact, some of them tried very hard to get out of their calling. Think of Gideon, for example. But when things got tough for them, they were all able to look back and know that God had called them. It's possible to be deluded about a calling. And, and as Baptists, one of the ways we try to guard against that is to discern God's will as a community, is to pray and talk together. For example, a calling to be a minister is to be tested and affirmed or not by the church members in partnership with the wider Baptist family. We don't actually recognize self-appointed leaders. We recognize God-appointed leaders and we see God's appointing as, as something we discern together. And the same applies to people going overseas with mission agencies like BMS and so on. So here's a question for you this morning. Might God be calling you? Don't rush to answer no. Might God be calling you? It might, might be slightly dangerous if you're rushing to answer yes as well. God doesn't always want people who are too quick to want to be leaders. But it's about listening, isn't it? It's about listening to God's voice. You might not want to be called, but that's only partly relevant. And a feeling of unworthiness is normally a good sign. But is God calling you? And you might say, well, I don't think I'm the kind of person God would call. Not, not to a significant role. You know, I'm only young, or I'm getting too old. I'm not, I don't have the right academic aptitudes. I'm retired now. You might think, depending on your background, I'm a woman and therefore it can't be me. Well, just be open to what God might be saying into your life. Would you hear God if he were calling you? Would you be prepared to submit to others and to ask them and talk to them and be influenced by whether they think you might be being called? And think for a moment about those who, who are called, who perhaps in a few weeks or months will be hearing about this church and will be thinking, is God calling me to go and minister at Gorse Hill Baptist Church? Maybe you could be praying for them, even though you don't know their, their names even now. But they will hear God's call. Whether it's to God saying, do go there or don't go there. And that when they do come, you will discern their call. Again, I'm going to pause for prayer. This time I'll lead us in a, in a short prayer before we move on. Dear God, we thank you for those you call. And we're reminded by Paul in the New Testament that, that oftentimes not many whom you call are wise and influential by worldly standards. Often you call the things, you call the people who seem to be not very impressive. Lord, I, I want to commit to you this church as it engages in this process of discernment about who you might be calling to minister here. 
pray for your hand to be on that. We, church, we pray that the church members here will recognise the person of your calling. And we pray for that person, whoever they are and wherever they currently are, to hear and to be responsive to your voice of calling. But we pray too for ourselves that if there's people here who you might be calling to some form of more clear and more um, obvious form of Christian leadership, whether that's here or even overseas, that you'll help us to be responsive to that calling too. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So, Noah stood out. Noah was called. Thirdly, Noah is responsive. Now, we might think that Christian leadership is all about having a big personality and lots of clever ideas. And God does sometimes call people with those qualities. But actually, God calls all sorts of people into leadership. Perhaps Noah did have some skills with hammers and saws, or maybe some affinity with animals, but nothing like that is ever mentioned in Genesis. We do not get the impression that Noah was called because he was good with the saw and the hammer, or because he liked animals. The main quality he shows in these chapters is his ability and willingness simply to hear what God says and then to do it. As I said before, Noah never speaks. He only does. He comes across as patient. They were in that ark for months, weren't they? You, if you read on the story, we didn't. We only had time to read the beginning, but if you read on the whole story through Genesis chapter 7 and 8, it was a long-term project, building the ark, being in the ark, with all those animals for months on end. For weeks, even after the rains had stopped, they just had to wait. Can you imagine what it was like being a leader in that situation? The pressure to open the door quick and get out. Can't bear it in here any longer. The pressure to chuck some animals over the side, I'm sure, at times. Qualities like obedience and patience may not sound very exciting, but in God's kingdom, they, be more, they may be more significant than charm or charisma. And most importantly, you see, Noah is God-orientated. Noah can hear God's voice. One of the very few times he does something off his own bat without being told by God is when they eventually come out of the ark. After all this time of being cooped up, what does Noah do? isn't told to this time. But what does Noah do? What's his first instinct? He worships. He builds an altar and he makes a sacrifice to God. That's where Noah's heart is. Noah's responsiveness to God. Paul writes, I was alluding to these words in my prayer just now, Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 1, think of what you were when you were called. He's not talking about leadership calling. Paul's talking about our calling to respond to Jesus. Think, Paul says, what you were. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were influential. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. God chose the lowly things of the world and the despised things and the things that are not to nullify the things that are so that no one may boast before him. What kind of qualities are we looking like, are we looking for in a leader? Someone of noble birth? Good luck with that. Someone who's, who's going to just, you know, immediately strike you by their force of personality or something like that. Well, I, th I, I don't think Noah points us in that direction. And neither does the Apostle Paul. And neither does the writer to the Hebrews when he talks about Noah. In Hebrews 11 verse 7, we read, By faith Noah, when warned about things not yet seen, in holy fear built an ark to save his family. By faith he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness that is in keeping with faith. Faith is the characteristic that is drawn out about Noah. 
So Noah stands out. Noah is called. Noah is responsive. And I want to give you one last thing to think about. And you might think this one's a bit odd because my fourth point is Noah points to Jesus. And you might be thinking, really? How can Noah point to Jesus? He hadn't even heard of Jesus. But the point is, as we stand back from the story of Noah, we see that God is at work in Noah's story. It's part, you see, of God's great story. A story which only makes sense in the light of Jesus. There are times in the Old Testament, there are times, in, like in this story of Noah, when the darkness seems thick. But as the story of God's people gradually progresses, we catch, his, we catch more and more glimpses of God's salvation plan. And the plan to save people in an ark from a flood is pointing us forward to someone else who is going to save people from something even worse than a flood. And eventually, of course, the sun breaks through and we see Jesus, the one in whom everything that has gone before suddenly makes sense. Let me give you an example by taking you to the end of Noah's story in chapter 9. I'm not going to read the passage. You can look at it later. It's a passage which, unsurprisingly, is not normally mentioned in Sunday school. Uh, In Genesis chapter 9, Noah plants some grapevines... And he gets drunk, not clear whether this was intentional or not, and he ends up stark naked and ashamed. And it's it's a strange tale. And it's as if Genesis is saying to us, oh dear, it's already going wrong again. We're already back to where we were at the start of Genesis 6. Although God had selected Noah, the best man going, and saved him from the flood, Noah was not actually up to the job. He wouldn't be able to fulfill all God's plans for humanity. He couldn't bear the weight of glory himself. Things are going to go wrong if you just rely on Noah. I don't like to tell you this, but when you get your new minister, he's not going to be able to bear the weight of everything. If you just rely on him or her, you're placing too big a burden on that person. You remember Genesis 1? What were human beings created to be? The image and glory of God. But already things are going wrong for Noah. When was the last time somebody was naked and ashamed in a garden? We see that in Genesis chapter 3. And here in Genesis chapter 9... It's happening again. There's Noah, naked and ashamed, in a garden. Adam and Eve sinned. Noah sins. We're back to square one. And that's why I mentioned earlier that the word grace appears for the first time in the story of Noah. The word grace and also the word covenant God makes a covenant with Noah, as he would with Abraham and then the Israelites. All of them people he would choose out of the world. All of them people to whom he revealed himself in new ways. But all of them people who let him down. Who failed to bear the weight of their tremendous calling. And all those covenants show something of God's grace and God's glory. But one day, another man came along. A man who was a descendant of Adam and Noah and Abraham, but a man who was also the eternal word made flesh, the only begotten son of the Father, full of grace and truth. This man said, as he sat with his disciples one evening, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. This man then went into a garden with his disciples where he was sorely tempted and he said to God, not my will, but yours be done. This man was tested in a garden and here at last was a man who was not found to be naked and ashamed before God. A few hours later, this man was pinned to a cross and there he was, naked and ashamed, but with a difference. 
because it was not his own nakedness and shame which was on display at the cross. It was my shame and your shame which held him there. As the prophet Isaiah foretold in one of those moments when the Old Testament darkness um, clears, he was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. Surely he bore our griefs and carried our sorrows. So Noah, in his nakedness and shame in his garden, points us to the one who is what he and we could never be, the true leader, the truly righteous one. And you can't be any kind of leader in God's kingdom until you've come to Jesus, until you've knelt at the cross and acknowledge we can never be what we're meant to be. We can only be anything as Jesus shines through us, as we take on his identity and point to him. I'm going to finish with some Bob Dylan. I'm not going to sing it. I'm not actually, I'm not sure that I'm a great fan of Bob Dylan, but I do think he had a way with words. So here's, a, here's some words from Do Bob Dylan that you might recognize. Um, and I want you to think how this might apply in your life. As you think back about what we've considered this morning, the life of Noah, the aspects of his calling, what it means to be a leader. Come gather round people, wherever you roam, and admit that the waters around you have grown and accept it that soon you'll be drenched to the bone. If your time to you is worth saving, then you'd better start swimming or you'll sink like a stone, for the times they are a-changing. Come senators, congressmen, please heed the call. Don't stand in the doorway, don't block up the hall, for he that gets hurt will be he who has stalled. There's a battle outside and it's raging. It'll soon shake your windows and rattle your walls, for the times they are a-changing. The line it is drawn, the curse it is cast, the slow one now will later be fast, as the present now will later be past. The order is rapidly fading, and the first one now will later be last, for the times they are a-changing. Dear God, we know that we live in a world of change, for good or ill. We know we live in a world where there is much sin, just as there was in the time of Noah. But we know that you have called us to be a people who will stand out and be different. We know that you have called each one of us to stand out, to hear your call on our lives. For some of us, that means to be, a, to be called into some form of Christian leadership. And for those people, we especially pray. But help us to be people who will stand out for you, who will discern the times, who will be prepared to lead us into times of newness and change, to recognize the times they are a-changing. But you are a God who is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Help us to be people who keep pointing to you. And grant us leaders, we pray, not the leaders we deserve, but the leaders that you want to bless us with who will help us to step forward into your plans and purposes for us. For we ask these things in the name of our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. I've chosen a final song which um, isn't really anything to do with Noah, but points us back to Jesus and all he's done for us. So uh, let's join and sing together about the wondrous cross.
just a final prayer from me before we go out for coffee. Heavenly Father, we just want to thank you for this time that we've spent together this morning. And we just thank you for your presence here with us. And I just pray that every single one of us this morning has met with you in whatever way it was they needed to be met. And I just pray, Lord Jesus, that as we leave this building and we go into a new, fresh week, whatever trials, whatever tribulations come our way, I just pray, Lord Jesus, that we will have that understanding and that total faith that you are there right beside us. And we only have to call out to you and you will hold our hand. May we be committed to worshipping and serving you in our daily lives, Lord. Lord, show us ways that we can bless other people every single day. Help us to see you, Lord, in the monotony of the mundane. Help us to see your blessings around us in the simple things that bring us joy every day, Lord Jesus. And as we leave this place, please fill us with your peace and help us to go forth with a real joy that can only come from you. Amen.